Hey, welcome everyone to our, our Ash Wednesday service here at Bethany Church and those of you who have logged in online for our Ash Wednesday. I don't know how you're going to receive the ashes through the screen that you're viewing, <laughs> but maybe you can find some cocoa in the cupboard or something and later <laughs> just put them on yourself, all right? Uh, but we're going to have a, a wonderful Ash Wednesday service here. I want to begin with a prayer and uh, then after that we're going to sing a song and we'll look a little bit at the word. And Father in heaven, we've gathered tonight in honor of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who set us the example. Oh, Lord, he ran the race, he finished the course, he laid down his life. And so, Lord, we view these, this series of weeks of Lent as a time of our own self-sacrifice. And then, Lord, we'll end it at the resurrection day when Jesus rose from the dead that we call Easter. Bless us, Lord, as we partake in reflection on our own lives and repentance and uh, obedience to you in this Ash Wednesday service. Bless us as we sing and bless us as we receive the ashes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I am weak, but thou art strong. Keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk, just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Now through this world of toil and snares, if I falter, Lord, who cares? Who with me my burden shares? None but thee. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord. Let it be. When my feeble life is o'er, time for me will be no more. Guide me gently, safely on to thy kingdom shore, to thy shore. walk with thee. Granted, Jesus, is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Oh, let it be, dear Lord, let it be. I want to talk about what it is, okay? What is this thing called Ash Wednesday? You know, Ash Wednesday begins 40 days, uh, uh, begins a 40-day period of reflection and prayer and fasting that focuses on Jesus Christ and his life and his suffering leading up to the cross. So I got 40 days marked out on the calendar. I hope you can see that. I put that slightly over that. But if you're very careful, you'll notice that there are actually 46 days, not 40 days. 
And the reason why we started on Wednesday and we don't uh, go a few days later is because Sundays are excluded from Lent. Because Sunday is not to be a time of fasting and mourning. It's supposed to be a time of celebration that Jesus Christ was victorious over sin and death and raised from the dead. So they exclude those days. And when you take those six days out from the 46, you've got 40 days. And that starts today. Today. That includes when we're talking about the life of Jesus Christ, his suffering leading up to the cross. Theologians have included in that his uh, active obedience. Now, by active obedience, it means what he did actively. Passive obedience is when he died on the cross and just passively let them uh, crucify him. So there's the active sufferings of Christ, and then there's the passive sufferings of Christ, the active ministry of Christ, and then the passive ministry of Christ. And then the active was that he was led by the Spirit, and he followed the Spirit's leading, into the wilderness for 40 days of fasting. And that's why uh, we include fasting along with our period of Lent, or Ash, start kicking off on Ash Wednesday. So I think everybody here fasts almost every day, every day. I don't know how long you fast, maybe 8 hours or maybe 12 hours. Some of you may fast a little longer than that. You go to bed at night and you don't eat anything for hours. And then in the morning, you see, you've given up eating for the night. And in the morning, you have a meal to break the fast, and we call that breakfast. We break the fast. We break the fast. And so we're breaking that fast. And so fasting is when you are surrendering something, giving it up, and in place, you're going to do something else. Now, for most of us, when we fast, we sleep. We've replaced eating with sleeping. Now, some of you, if you're like me, in the middle of the night, you break your fast early because you're a little hungry. In the middle of the night, you go to the refrigerator and you get a little snack. And, and then, then you go back to your fasting again, okay? That's what Sundays do for our period of 40 days so that uh, we are celebrating on Sundays the resurrection of our Lord. But the rest of the time, we're reflecting. There's reflection. We're praying and we're fasting, we're replacing something else for what I would normally be doing. You might want to fast during your lunch and use that. I'm going to replace that with prayer. And that kind of thing is going on. Now, for those who want to do this, we're going to find that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. What this is saying is, if you're going to try to pursue for 40 days like Jesus a course of action, where you're going to give up something, you are going to be tempted. It's not if I'm tempted, it's a matter of when I am tempted. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. It's very clear from the scriptures that the full 40 days he was being tempted, but three were recorded. Now, I want to jump to what the apostle John writes. John says that there are three aspects to that temptation that will come in your period of fasting or giving something up for the Lord so that you can reflect on him and your spiritual life. Our adversary, the devil, uses the world in which we live to tempt us. And it comes in three facets. For all that is in the world, he says, the lust of the flesh. My body craves things such as food, air. Oh, yeah, I really need air. Drink. I got to have water. Other things it craves, sex, power, authority, it goes on and on. My, my body wants that shelter, clothing. It's all these things my body wants, the lust of the flesh. It's the things that my body craves. Our adversary will use that against us. The lust of the eyes, the things that I look at and I covet. I just want those. I want those things. And then there's the pride of life. These are the things that just make me feel really good. Really good. I am somebody uh, I am proud of my life. He says, this is not of the Father, but these things are of the world. Now, we first are introduced to these concepts of lust of the flesh in the book of Genesis. In Genesis, by the third chapter, there's a serpent. He is the devil. We know that from the Revelation. tells us, identifies that old serpent, which is the devil. The serpent comes, and he says to Eve, did God really say that the day you eat thereof, you'll surely die? And she said, oh yeah, he really said that. In fact, he said that 
we're, we can eat of any of the trees in the garden, but not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because in the day that we eat thereof, we will surely die. And he says, you won't surely die. I'll tell you what, temptation always comes with ch challenging God's word and trying to say, you're the exception. It doesn't apply to you. You don't have to listen to that. Well, it says that when, when, when she saw, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food. You say, I don't know, maybe she was hungry. It was a bright, beautiful day in the garden. The sun is shining through. All of a sudden, it's glistening and shining. On We're not told what the fruit is. We always put an apple there as the temptation fruit, but who knows, it may have been something else. But it catches her eye that it's good for food. I'm hungry. That'll satisfy it. Surely God will make an exception for me. And that is a rationalization that goes on. It's good for food. And you know what happened. She went ahead and she took of that fruit. Fast forward to the New Testament. Jesus is in the wilderness. He's wandering and he's fasting for his 40 days and 40 nights. And the devil comes to him and said to him, Oh, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Prior to this, it said he was really hungry. Now, if you've been in fasting at all, I don't know if you've fasted for a long period of time. The longest I have has been 10 days. And in my 10-day fast, you know, first day I went, ate half of what I would normally eat. The next day, ate a quarter of what I'd normally eat. And then the next day, I didn't eat anything. And then I did that for a period of days, and then I came back. But you get to a point where you are really starving, and then you get to a point where you're not hungry at all. You're not hungry at all. The Bible says he was really hungry. And the devil comes to him at that point and says, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. He's trying to tempt Jesus with the lust of the flesh, the desires of the body. He's hungry. My body craves food. And so he's dangling it out there. How many have noticed when you start a diet, food becomes that much more attractive? <laughs> you just want that. And that's what's going on. And so the devil knows that he's hungry. And so he said, you got the power because you're God, come in the flesh, you can make the stones and the bread and satisfy your desires. And Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I'd rather obey the scriptures than my own bodily desires, the lust of the flesh. So what's that mean for us? The lust of the flesh. Our adversary, who tricked Eve, tempted Jesus, but not successfully, is using the same strategies according to the apostle John. He's going to, when you so choose, that I am going to give up something for a period of 40 days that you will find that all of a sudden he's going to put things in your way so that your body craves them. Them. That's what you're up against. The second thing is the lust of the eyes that John records. Not only does he use the lust of the flesh, but the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes is seeing something that you want. You will begin to covet. I don't know what it may be. He may use uh, your neighbor's new car. He may use whatever it may be. Someone else's promotion that you will have a lust of the eyes. I want that two. We find it was in the garden with the woman, Eve. It says, when the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food, but it was also pleasing to the eyes. I want that. That craving desire of something that is not yours that you want. Something that was forbidden, but now you want it. You want it. Same came with the Lord Jesus Christ. It worked for Eve. He tried to use it on Jesus. The lust of the flesh, now the lust of the eyes, the devil led him up to a high place, and he showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. Can you imagine what he saw? The Greek Empire, the Roman Empire. He, he saw all the empires, the British Empire, the American Empire, whatever empires are yet to come. He flashes them all before him. He says, listen, I will give you all of these if you will worship me. It'll all be yours. It'll all be yours. That desire, the lust of the eyes, 
of wanting. He's trying to get Jesus to want something and worship him. I'll give it to you. Here's the payoff. If you'll just worship me. And Jesus said, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And so he responded to that particular temptation with the word of God. The lust of the eyes. I don't know what it is that is so attractive to you. We find uh, on our television sets and the movies and Hollywood, they portray the most beautiful men, the most beautiful women, as objects of lust of the eyes. In fact, we even got a new word for it. It's called eye candy. Things that I want, I like. Eye candy, I lust, I, I want those things. Every commercial appeals to your lust of your eyes. They flash with us. You know, I've seen the burgers on TV. In the commercials, they look so good. But when I buy them in the store and unwrap them, what happened to this one? It looks like they ran over it with a truck. They make it look so appealing. It's lust of the eyes that you just want it. you got to have it. And you will face that in the next 40 days when you make a commitment that I'm going to reflect on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to substitute something for God in place of what I was doing. You are going to be tempted. The pride of life. So I got the thinker here. This guy is really, really thinking about life itself. But my text is about a woman, so I tried to find a thinker woman. <laughs> because it says in Genesis, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eyes, and desirable for gaining wisdom. You see, the serpent promised that she would be like God, knowing good and evil, is what God said. This tree, you eat of it, you'll know good and evil. If I eat of this, I'll be all the wiser. I, you see, God has been holding out on me. If I eat this, I'll be like God. And that is not true. She was already like God. God made man in his image. She was made in the image of God. She's already like God. He's promising her something so empty. But she sees it, she buys into it, and she partakes of it because she thinks it's going to make her life that much better. That's the question of our adversary. When it came to Jesus, a similar thing took place. The devil takes Jesus and led him to Jerusalem and had him stand at the highest point of the temple. It's called the pinnacle of the temple. And he said, if you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from there. God will command his angels to catch you. You won't hurt yourself. Save yourself. You're in a, you're in a desperate situation. But Jesus responds, do not put the Lord your God to the test. It's not right to tempt the Lord God Almighty. We're told after this one, when the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Those words right there, until an opportune time, it was like they hit me all anew. Like I've read the Bible before, I know that they're there, but this time they hit me. Satan just backed off and was looking for a new opportunity. And that's what happens with temptation. You may conquer it today, whatever it may be. Whatever it is in your life that you're, you're trying, you're battling with, you may conquer it today. And he says, okay, you got it today, but I'll be back tomorrow. Oh, I'll be back next week. I I'm going to come at another angle. I'm going for you. But Jesus never gave in. So when he was finished with those 40 days of testing Jesus, he left him and waited for a new opportunity. The pride of life. What is it that makes you all puffed up and proud, arrogant, boast? You know that that's going to be an occasion that comes when you make a decision that I'm going to reflect and I'm going to pray and I'm going to fast for the next 40 days. So here's the deal. In the next 40 days, you will be tested with the lust of the flesh, with the lust of the eyes, and with the pride of life. So what are you going to do? Whoa. Do this. Resist temptation. 
Jesus had the victory because he kept quoting the scriptures. It is written. It is written. It is written. So you use the word of God. We're a Bible preaching te teaching church. I preach and teach every week out of the Bible, hoping that some of it will stick so that during the week when you are bombarded, you'll say, oh, the Word of God says, and I'm going to do what the Word of God says rather than all the things the world are bombarding me with because Satan is out to destroy me. I will quote the Scripture. so important to memorize verses from the Bible. Second thing, not only will you quote the Word of God, but you pray. This is what you do to resist temptation. You pray for help. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, talking about our high priest, Jesus Christ, who has ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he intercedes for us. He makes sense out of our nonsense when we pray. He says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are yet was without sin. Jesus never caved. This is what it says. So let us approach the throne of grace with confidence. The throne of grace. Jesus is seated in heaven on a, on a throne, and it's called the throne of grace because when we go there, he gives us gifts. It's not a seat of judgment. He's not going to judge us. He's going to be gracious to us. He says, approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of our need. I have found this. It's pretty hard to yield to temptation when you're on your knees praying. I know that I might get up. As soon as I get up, the temptation might get stronger again. Then what do I do? You got to get back on your knees and pray. You pray, you pray. You quote the scriptures, you pray for help. The third thing that you want to do is you want to take the way out. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there, <clears throat> that there's no temptation, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but will also, with the temptation, provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. He always opens the door. Always opens the door. If you will trust him, he will open the door. My sister-in-law, who is uh, dying of cancer in her, I guess her uh, early 40s, she did needlepoint. She needlepointed a, a little picture. It says, when God closes a door, he always opens a window. There is always a way out when there's a temptation. You just sometimes need to flee through the door that he has opened. The final thing I want to put here, what do you do? You resist the temptation. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in your faith. You've got to say, I believe, I believe, I believe, Lord. I trust in you. Lord, help me, help me. I believe. I want to resist him. I'm not going to listen to him. I'm not going to follow him. You believe, you stand firm in your faith. With that being said, we're going to receive some ashes. In order to do that, I'm going to put my mask on. I'll invite you to come up. You know, historically, um, the, the blessing that came with the ashes was uh, ashes to ashes and, and, and dust to dust. That's not very positive, but it's just to remind us of our mortality, our frailty. And then the, the, the blessing was changed. And I can't recall the year it was changed, but it was changed. Uh, repent and believe in the gospel. I want to suggest that our blessing tonight will just simply be stand firm in the faith. Stand firm in the faith. For the next 40 days, just say to yourself, I'm standing firm in the faith. Standing firm in the faith. Come now, and you may receive ashes. almost forgot myself here. How did I do? May the Lord bless us by standing firm in our faith.
in the morning when I rise in the morning when I rise in the morning when I rise give me Jesus give me Jesus give me Jesus Jesus. The Apostle John said, all that is of the world, we don't want the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. So give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. God bless you for coming for Ash Wednesday, and just have a wonderful remainder of the week. Good night.